Dear students, welcome to this lecture on research methods for computer science and information systems. My name is Klaus Schmidt and I'm professor here for software systems engineering. In this semester, we will cover a broad range of different research methods. But before we jump into those, let's give you a brief introduction of what research methods are about what their role play in the scientific endeavor and what this lecture will provide to you. Let's start with a short motivation. Why should you be interested in research methods? Whenever we talk about research, we mean with that the creation of knowledge through systematic approaches. And that's exactly where research methods come in. There is no research without some sort of methodology. And over the decades and centuries, even millennia, people developed methods on how to do proper research. This is what we try to teach in this lecture. Some of those uh, methods, not a, not all and everything under the sun, but some of those which are particularly relevant to research in your field. Why is it important to, do, to use systematic approaches? Because otherwise, if you do not follow a systematic approach, it's pretty likely that you will come up with false conclusions about the subject. You would get answers, but the answers will simply not be correct. It's also an issue that research is not only an individual endeavor. Of course, in your thesis you will do research, and this will be your individual work. But it only becomes research, in a broader sense, by sharing it with others, so that others can build on your research and that requires this research to be repeatable. For this, it needs to be understandable how did you come up with the specific conclusions, with the specific results you present. No? Or to put it differently, if you do not follow proper research methods, the results will simply not be believed. So. In your study program, there are several milestones where you actually need to do research. It may be small or it may be big, it may be on various different topics, and actually you will use different methods. So, in your work, you will not use all of these methods that we will present here, but we believe that the number of methods we show you will provide you with a good foundation to select from in your future research. This research may happen as part of an IT study project, it may be your master's thesis, it may be later on your PhD thesis or something that you do in industry because industry does research as well. That's how you derive new knowledge to develop new products. So the capability that we aim to give you here is to, to do research fundamentally correct. And that is something that is ex actually expected by anybody holding a master degree at a university. Yeah. So what we will present in this particular lecture can be seen as a toolbox, basically a toolbox of research methods. Yeah. You can read here experimental approaches, case studies, formal approaches, literature reviews. We will also talk about statistics, how they are relevant and what are the uh, problems in using them in research and so on. That also means we will basically have a brief look at each of these tools. We will not make you an expert in using a hammer well, or in in, in using a screwdriver. What we try to present you in this lecture is an overview, a good understanding of what kind of methods are out there, 
some basic knowledge of these methods. So if later on you need them, you know where to look, where to deepen your knowledge, and to, to get a head start on the research you have to do. So what is research? Let's take a step back from a very fundamental point of view, and this is more general than just software engineering or information systems research. Research always is about having a systematic approach to create new knowledge. And with new knowledge, we mean new in the sense of not known to anyone out there. So it's generally new to the world as a whole. And it's knowledge in the sense that there is a strong foundation to make these outcomes, to make these uh, results really believable. No? So it's not just an assumption, it's not just an idea, yeah? but it's knowledge. We have some certainty that the world is as it is described, as a result of research. The final goal of research is typically some form of theory formation. It's creating an understanding that enables us to make predictions, basically. Yeah? So forecasting, predicting something which we have not yet seen or which we, which we have not yet built is basically the hallmark of good research. But it's more complex than that. So theory formation is one aspect. We try to create a theory in research, and this theory is then used to predict an outcome. And then we can perform experiments and can validate whether this outcome is actually what we observe in reality. This may be correct, meaning the experiment basically comes up with the expected results, or, and that's actually more interesting, it may be incorrect. The results differ from what our theory predicted. In that case, the real outcome informs further theory formation. This back and forth is foundational to any form of research. It's not just computer science or information systems. It's also physics, chemistry, biology. It's all the hard sciences work basically like that. The inquiry cycle is a fundamental representation of how research is done. We always start with some sort of theory, some current understanding that we have of the situation. In the worst case, this fundamental understanding may be we have no idea. Yeah? So this basically corresponds to the empty theory, so to speak. Uh, but whatever our current understanding, our best rules and knowledge to explain and predict things in, in the target area is, that's what we call the theory. Then comes one of the fundamental and very important steps in any research. Precisely define your problem. This is one of the most common mistakes that is not clearly and well defined. Typically, we call that the research question. And having a good understanding of what the research question actually is, is often a problem in itself. So it's not like you sit on your chair and, and just wonder, oh, okay, this could be my research problem, or this would be the research question. It's often by itself an iterative process where you go through various formulations of the research question until it is so well defined that it can drive your research, because that's what it actually does. It drives a research. It's a basis for deriving a research study design. And how you do that 
that will, one of, will be one of the subjects of this lecture. The study design is basically the approach that we take to find an answer. And there are fundamentally different types of study design depending on the kind of research questions that we have, depending on, on also on some external constraints that our research is subject to. The following step, we execute the study itself, meaning what we define to do in the research study design, we actually do. The next step is to analyze the results and that re results lead us to revise the theory if necessary, if it actually was empty before, to add our first items of knowledge to it, you know, or if it was actually a quote-unquote boring result, then it fully complies with our theory, then there's no revision to be done. You know? So you heard right. In case a research project basically leads to expected results, it's actually the case where you learn the least, not the most from it. No. You just have another data point from this research that your theory holds, but that's it. More interesting is if the observations that you do in the study lead you to new insights, and therefore to better theories. This also shows that at any point in time we, we always have the possibility in research that with the next experiment, with the next study that we do, we may find new things that actually may invalidate and contradict some of the things that we thought before. So research tries to continuously improve our understanding of the world, which, taken in another way, also means that we probably never have a perfect understanding of the world. Another step, and actually the last step, is to publish research results. Publications are descriptions of the research according to certain quality standards. Typically it's important that Others can follow this research and it's plausible to believe that this research has been done correctly. This is actually one of the points where research methods are very important because if I see a study or somebody sees a study and it doesn't follow any reasonable research approach, why would I believe any claims that the person does? It has to be systematic and has to be well done to ensure that there are not unnecessary mistakes in the research. No? And the, re the publication is supposed to exhibit this research, to communicate it to others, actually to the rest of the world, so that others can build on these results. But they only want to build on results if these results have a strong foundation. Typically, such research is published in peer-reviewed journals or conferences. What a good kind of uh, journals and conferences depend on the specific um, research area. And that's something, for example, to discuss with a supervisor if you are doing a master thesis or such. So, let's go into details. What is a theory? I already mentioned it's basically capturing our understanding of the situation in a certain domain. So it's a combination of statements as well as derivation rules to predict outcomes. What are derivation rules, you may ask? No, what are statements here? So it's basically what we know and how do we combine the items of knowledge to predict in more complex situations. So, if you know the basic laws of physics, perhaps, and you know the mathematics that binds those individual statements together, and this enables you to make outcomes to new situations. 
This is typically used in one of two ways. First is explanation. That's what the main focus of theories in the natural sciences is. You know, we try to explain why some observation of nature is as we perceive it. The other is construction. This is what is the goal in all engineering disciplines. And I would say, for example, computer science is typically an engineering discipline. But often we also try to understand things more in an explanatory way, like uh, in software engineering where we try to understand how developers actually work and what are the problems they face, or in information systems, how IT transforms organizations. These kind of things, they are more explanatory studies. So in some sense, computer science, information systems, it's a mixture of both. Yeah? But in the classical disciplines, it's typically a bit more, more clearer differentiated. A very special case is mathematics, at least as far as it applies to pure mathematics. Because mathematics is a discipline which talks not about reality in the first place. It talks about the theory itself. It's actually these derivation rules that we mentioned before that mathematics deals with. So the basic idea is that we have this picture from earlier where we have theory and experiment interacting and mathematics basically works within the theory. It basically says if this is correct in your theory you also have to expect this and that in your theory. That's what mathematics is about and that's actually why it's so powerful and applicable across a large range of different disciplines because this is basically what it always does. All disciplines have some sort of theory and as soon as I have a derivation structure that I can create new items of knowledge from existing items of knowledge in a theory, that's when mathematics comes in. That makes it so fundamental. Let's have a look at an example. We will take it from classical sciences because we did not discuss about research in computer science and such so, so very much yet. We will do that at a later point. So our example is a simple one that you may know from, from uh, your school education. A stone is thrown and hits the ground. Physics gives you the law of gravity. It asks the why and how question. Why does a stone fall to the ground and how can its motion be predicted? Mathematics allows you to draw conclusions based on this physical theory, meaning it allows you to derive special cases from the fundamental laws of physics, for example. And engineering would mean for example, create an apparatus that throws a stone a certain distance. Yeah. Again, we have to predict in engineering, but here we create the reality and the outcome is given. Here we look at reality and try to understand the outcome. Whatever perspective you take, the theory that describes the, loose, the laws of mo movement that's basically the central artifact. So now let me come to your question. If we talk about research in computer science and information science, it's typically like in the natural sciences, like mathematics, or like engineering. Now stop the recording until you came up with an answer for you. Okay, welcome back. Well, the answer is, as I already hinted, it depends on the research goal. It can be like the natural sciences, meaning we try to do theory formation. We want to understand, for example, we want to understand how software is created in real development teams. 
We want to understand how the introduction of an IT solution transforms the organization. Or it can be like engineering. We want to create new approaches for more efficient testing of software systems, for example. That's actually a research challenge in software engineering. Or we want to create ways for introducing IT solutions that are particularly successful in real organizations. These are actually engineering endeavors. The interesting aspect also is that in the computer science and information systems area, the engineered artifacts, those which we are creating, these can be either methods or technical artifacts, like tools or complete software solutions. Okay, let's continue with the research questions. What is a valid research question? It supports the prediction. It can, at least in principle, be answered. And here are some examples for that. For example, does the moon revolve around the Earth and why? What kind of errors can be identified by testing method X? How does testing compare to inspections for identifying software defects? Is there any more performant sorting algorithm than n log n? All of those are perfectly valid research questions. The last three actually are relevant in software, uh, well, are relevant to computer science and to software engineering and information systems. Well, the first one is only relevant for physics. Counterexamples would be what is the best developed method, as opposed to one out of set, uh, out of a set of methods. This is something we can basically not answer, and we actually know we cannot answer it even before we start, because how would you enumerate all potential development methods, how would you predict all of the, their potential outcomes? Because that's what, in some sense, you actually would have to do. That's basically impossible. And therefore, it's not a good way of approaching research. Even so, it's a question in the software engineering domain. Another is, does God exist? That's certainly not a typical question for the hard sciences. It has a simple, uh, sorry, it has a similar uh, issue, meaning observability, because uh, we can hardly observe uh, God in the meaning of the word. Perhaps it's an interesting research question for philosophy, but that's outside the scope of this lecture. Now let's discuss study designs. The study design aims to answer the question how to approach the generation of knowledge. How do we create an answer to the question that we have? There are many different types of approaches and we will discuss a number of different categories, different high-level approaches. We will also especially discuss potential traps that you may run into if you try to uh, follow these approaches, and we also try to give you guidelines on how to avoid the traps. Why are there so many approaches? Because which approach to use strongly depends on the situation. The type of research questions, any context factors, what can we do in a certain situation, required qualities of the results, like uh, so-called threats of validity, how, how transferable is, should our knowledge be to other situations and such. Generic characteristics of good research, and that should be guaranteed by the study designs, is the research should be well documented, it should be replicable, meaning others should be able to replicate what you have done, 
Here, of course, also the documentation comes in, but also that you use one of the standard accepted research methods helps to do the replication. And it should be refutable, meaning it should be done in a way that if there is an issue with the research, it, it's possible to find it and show that this problem exists and therefore the outcome of the research was not per uh, perfectly correct. Let's come to the last part, to the publications. I don't want to discuss all kinds of publications that there are. Only these high-level types I briefly want to mention. So there's workshops. These are typically venues for publishing, but more importantly for discussing preliminary work. This is where people exchange when they do not yet have the final conclusions or final results and they just bounce ideas back, back and forth to examine the quality of the work done so far and whether they are on the right track. Then there are conferences. This is typically validated work. A conference paper has a limited size of publications, meaning a rather small number of pages that are allowed. Therefore, it's work that has already been evaluated, validated, but it is not uh, too broad or too encompassing. No? The third one are journals. These are larger pieces of work, or really large pieces of work that are published there. They can have a length of three times, four times that of a conference paper, no? or even more. And therefore they typically present uh, large pieces of work in, in rather detailed fashion. The value of the different uh, levels of publication differs among the disciplines. For example, computer science is one of the few where conferences are really uh, taken in high regard. In other disciplines, it's typically more only the focus on journals. So this is a slight difference, but even within each of these categories, there are quality differences or differences of respect also. Uh, and um, that also has to be taken into account when we look at existing publications because the venue tells us something about the scrutiny to which this research was already evaluated. The standard for evaluating research is peer review. What does that mean? A peer is a person knowledgeable in the area, typically researching as well in the same area, and therefore is best suited to understand whether there are any flaws or problems with an intended publication. And today, basically in all major venues, three to four peers look at existing work, comment on it, evaluate it, and only if they clear it it's basically ready for publication. Now that's basically what one gets with the conference and journals. While this is, can really be regarded as a quality paradigm in research, there are still problems. Even in a peer review, even if you have multiple peers, reviewers may simply miss a problem that exists. No? Also, publications are influenced by the reviewers in the sense of there is typically a back and forth, meaning anonymous reviewers give feedback, the authors make modification, enhancements, etc. to the paper. Ideally, that's for the better, that's what peer review is for, but that's not actually guaranteed. It's a social process after all. And last but not least, there can be the problem of closed communities, certain sub-circles which basically review each other's work um, and then uh, the whole point of peer review can be destroyed. These problems exist, it's important to recognize them, but it should not be taken as there is no guarantee or no, no need to believe it's good research. In the majority of cases and for the practitioners in the areas it's 
be well understood, what are good venues, and for those, typically you have pretty good expectations for the quality of the research. There are also different types of research. Let me just introduce that as brief definitions. The first one can be seen as layers of research. There's primary research, it's basically evaluating a question directly. No? The secondary research is basically combining information from primary research to get a more complete picture. What that basically means is I'm not going to the lab in secondary research, but I'm going to the library and take a lot of existing primary research on a subject area I'm interested in and try to piece together from all of these individual publications a more holistic picture of the state of research in a certain field. And sometimes there's tertiary research. That's actually pretty rare. It also depends a bit on the kind of discipline. What that basically means is you do the same approach as with secondary research, but you actually apply it on secondary research, meaning you uh, combine the outcome of many secondary research items of several literature study to get an even more comprehensive picture. Then there is a, dif a differentiation between empirical versus non-empirical research. And that there's not one is good and the other is bad, but there is a place for both of them. Empirical research basically resorts to reality meaning we gather information from real observation, perhaps in a controlled environment, we study developers, we study people in an organization, we study also technical artifacts, but we observe them as they are from a realistic point of view. And then there's non-empirical work. That's basically theoretical work, may be closely related to mathematical work, that tries to improve the theories that we have on some subject matter. As a consequence, we have a pretty large range of different uh, scientific methods. These actually uh, address different research needs. They range from empirical to formal stuff, and they range from more technology to people-oriented approaches. Many of those we will discuss in this lecture series. So how do we select research methods? What are the influential factors? First of all, of course, the research question itself. We may have questions about the behavior of people. Then there are certain research methods that actually address interacting with people right? because certain precautions have to be taken in, in such a situation. On the other hand, we have, may have questions about technical artifacts. Then the constraints are very, very different and other research methods can apply. We also have research questions that are consequences of existing theories. This is going for more mathematical oriented research where we have to reason within theories, what are the consequences of them. A very important influential factor for selecting is how often can we replicate. This is particularly an issue if we do empirical work, how many observations can we actually do? If we interact with people, typically these are not too many. And still, within that, there are variations. Sometimes, if you, for example, observe projects, you might be happy if you just can observe a project and you end up with case studies. In other cases, you have some replications, like four, five, six projects, which is already pretty good. But if, for example, we have smaller tasks that we can do with a large number of people, like tasks only lasting for a day or so, then we can scale up sometimes to several hundreds of applications. Then again, if we observe technical artifacts, we may have hundreds of thousands, millions of applications. 
of this lends itself to very different ways of how the research has to be executed and can be executed. This thus influences our selection. And also, what kind of goal do we predominantly try to achieve with our research? Do we want to understand the concepts and identify a hypothesis? Do we already have a clear hypothesis? We just want to validate? Do we want to have a better understanding of the frontier, of the state of the art of the research? All of this, again, are very different research methods. Let's again do a small question. If you have a scientific result, a theory, is it guaranteed to be correct? Now stop the recording until you have an answer for yourself and then come back to this video. Okay, the answer is unfortunately no. It's not a guarantee. If we do research, Research methods try to maximize the objectivity and the chances of the correctness of the results, but there's always a potential for error. We may have missed or observed something that violates the theory. If we only replicate five times, the sixth replication may have shown us something different, but we never got around to see that, because we cannot infinitely observe. No? Or we made mistakes in the reasoning, or we look, overlooked something in the empirical setup. All of this can happen. Of course, having systematic methods with research try to minimize these issues as far as possible. But the margin of error will never be zero, not in realistic, non trivial research. So, at this point in time, Systematic research is the best way humankind has found so far to identify solid knowledge. It has its issues, but it's unfortunately still the best. Let's return to the content of the lecture in a bit more detail. We will not be able to comprehensively address all research methods. There are many research methods. Even those that we will discuss in this lecture actually originate from very different disciplines. Some of them originate from medicine or from social sciences. Some are more like classical engineering. Some are coming from mathematics. Some are secondary research methods, etc. No. So we will cover a large range, but it's not comprehensive. So how do we plan the lecture as a whole? We will start with more fundamental topics. We will discuss metrics, statistical issues in research, the notion of threats to validity. The term will probably not ring a bell right now, but it's a very important one. Then we will discuss some primary methods like experiments with humans, case studies, technical experiments, formal methods approaches, and others. Then we will also discuss secondary methods like systematic literature review and mapping studies. And finally, we will also slightly go into auxiliary methods like grounded theory. With that, let's see you again in the next chapter.